is Reza Sadki of the Geneva Learning Foundation. We're one minute and 45 seconds away from kicking off week two, the 30th of May, of what we call the launch pad in the impact accelerator uh, of the movements for Immunization Agenda 2030. If you don't know what all that means, stay with us. We'll be explaining exactly what it is, what we are offering and what members of the Movement for Immunization Agenda 2030 are doing and why. So that's wonderful uh, to see that we are kicking off uh, in the earnest in one minute and nine seconds. Uh, see you soon. Thirtieth of May, and we're not at the beginning of the movement. We had two weeks of the ideas engine for immunization agenda 2030, and four weeks of situation analysis, two weeks of action planning, and we're now in week two of the impact accelerator, where everyone developed an action plan for immunization agenda 2030, focused on their local challenge, and is now busy thinking and doing to implement this action plan. Will be starting kicking off in just 18 seconds we have some special guests today partners of immunization agenda 2030 we're very much looking forward to this session and to join welcoming our guests as well see you in a few seconds you can count down with me five four three two one and here we go a warm welcome to you from geneva switzerland I'm Reda Sadki of the Geneva Learning Foundation. We're kicking off today the uh, week two of uh, the what we call the Impact Accelerator, a collaborative process to support each other in going faster in order to do better or going doing better in order to go faster. You can choose. And uh, today is very special because at the end of this assembly, if you stay all the way to the end, you'll have the opportunity to connect with uh, people from your country, from uh, specifically. So in the room with us, we're just starting out and there are many, many more people uh, following on uh, social media. Um, there are people from over 110 countries. And at the end, of this session we'll be able to uh you'll be able to go to the telegram uh channel for your country and actually talk to each other for the very first time in the movement there have been many other opportunities to connect individually in various groups but this is really the uh, uh the day we've been waiting for now before I introduce, we have some special guests who've joined us in principle who are in the room. Uh, I'd like us, including our guests, uh, um, to uh, listen to the following. So just to tell you who will be joining us uh, the, from the responsive feedback team. We're honored to have Professor K. Vish Visvanatha from the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public, uh, Public Health with us. And then uh, for the second week in a row, we have the IA2030, so that's Immunization Agenda 2030 Indicators team with us. And we've got, they ask, uh, they ask members of a movement questions last Monday, and this time, we're the ones who have questions for them. But before we do that, you remember last week at the assembly, we heard and we spoke with Charlotte as she had just finished speaking at the 75th World Health Assembly about IA2030, so at the official side event at the Canadian Diplomatic Mission in Geneva, Switzerland. Here you can see again pictures of Charlotte. Let's zoom in a little bit. But what we've done this time is we have actually asked Charlotte to uh, record a proper version of the message which she presented at this occasion. So let's kick off with that and we'll be asking our guests what you know, to respond and to comment on what they hear. This is the message Charlotte Mbu delivered on behalf of the Movement for Immunization Agenda 2030. I am one of the 6,000 health professionals who joined the Movement for Immunization Agenda 2030 in March 2022. This was after working for over 10 years for the Ministry of Health in the South region of my country. We responded to Dr. Tedros's call at last year's World Health Assembly for a groundswell of support for immunization. Everyone who joins the movement comes with a goal to solve a key challenge, like reaching remote rural areas, working with the urban poor, or serving mobile populations. But what struck me is how often a new member says, I thought that only my country is facing this challenge. 
Any one of these challenges is difficult. Most of us are facing several at once. These challenges cannot be overcome by any one immunization worker, any one country, or any one organization, no matter how smart, powerful, or well-funded. Vaccines work when we work together across borders and boundaries. In the first two weeks, immunization practitioners from around the world shared 941 ideas and practices through the IDS engine, a digital platform developed by the Geneva Learning Foundation. Most of us are government workers from the so-called lower levels of the health system. Through this digital platform, we are working side by side with colleagues from national teams, in-country partners, and civil society organizations. Yes, our mission remains to carry out our ministry's plan. To do so requires us to adapt and tailor our actions hand in hand with the communities we serve. We are defying distance to support each other, using our own local resources and capacities to achieve the goals of IA 2030. The movement offers no per diem, no law of funding, or other extrinsic incentives. Yet, every week, members from all over the world meet to share experience. Last Thursday, Wasnam Faye Mame Sokna joined us. A midwife, she was transferred from a hospital to a poorly performing, poorly resourced rural health facility. Within months, she turned around her facility. She went from vaccinating four children to 30 children per session. Who was there to help her? It was a fellow member of the movement who lives 3,560 kilometers away. Using only email and WhatsApp, he shared his practical experience of how to organize vaccination sessions, how to order vaccines, and how to write a monthly vaccination report. In response to low vaccine uptake, she created a team of angels turning mothers into peer educators. That idea came from the IA2030 IDS engine. You will undoubtedly hear many personal stories during the World Health Assembly. The significance of this story is not only that an exemplary leader was able to improve performance, it is how she did so. By connecting in a digital human network of peers united by a common purpose. There is one challenge that is especially close to my heart. Earlier this year, 143 women from 38 countries formed the Women Who Deliver Vaccines Collective. We believe that if we could integrate women at all levels of decision making, this will strengthen leadership for immunization. We will never have connected without this movement. IA2030 is the common strand that binds us across so many different boundaries of geography, job roles, system levels, and gender. Connecting those working in rural health facilities, staff from national government workers, and even members of global IA2030 working groups based here in Geneva. Gordon Yibe is a health facility worker. His goal in the IA2030 movement is to find new ways to involve fathers in routine immunization. The movement has set a new pace for us, he said, making us realize how important our local work is in making global impact. Dr. Folake Olayinka, USAID's immunization team lead, summed it up in this way. We have said that we want to listen and that co-creation is very important. The Geneva Learning Foundation brings a direct link to people on the front lines. This is exactly the type of innovative approach that we need to overcome the complex challenges we are faced with in global health. Support from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Wellcome Trust, and others have helped us to make sparks. I am convinced that with your support, we can ignite a fire helping this movement grow and thrive until the goals of IA 2030 are attained. It is critical to strengthen the global health architecture to watch for the next pandemic 
to prepare for it and to rapidly manufacture new vaccines. It is an equally vital investment to build a global platform connecting people and communities. This is the potential of the Movement for Immunization Agenda 2030. That was Charlotte and Boo in last, uh, last week's World Health Assembly side event dedicated to Immunization Agenda 2030. We know her and appreciate her. She was not there only to speak in her own name. She was there to speak on behalf of the movement. We wanted to share the full, <laughs> yeah, the full presentation of what she shared uh, last week. Uh, uh, just a little bit over a year ago, we asked you this question, what is the future of immunization? And then in the succeeding months, we built together what became the Movement for Immunization Agenda 2030, launched on the 7th of March, reaching today 44,919 immunization professionals worldwide. This is not only about the connections we have with you, but it is about the connections you uh, build with each other. In the coming weeks, we're going to be inviting guests uh, from partners and um, friends and other organizations. Uh, we're kicking off uh, this week with a uh, special guest on responsive feedback and then the IA 2030 indicators team, also special and back for the second week. But first of all, many of you have received the invitation to join the module, the online learning module to learn about responsive feedback. We're going to speak today with Professor Vish Viswanath from the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, who is one of the co-creators of responsive feedback he's going to tell us what it is but before we we uh, uh we do that i'd like to first ask him after having listened to uh the this address at the world health assembly side event for ia 2030 uh what are his thoughts as a uh, um, a researcher who studies and practitioner of leadership of management what did he hear in the uh the address delivered by charlotte and uh vish a warm welcome to you first and foremost uh, good morning, uh, or good afternoon, good evening, uh, depending on which part of the world you are in. Uh, sorry, my voice is uh, a little strange. Uh, I just got back late last night from uh, Europe after having attended a meeting. Um, uh, so, um, I, I think um, uh, what I want to say is um, I just came back from a meeting uh, where uh, the chief scientist of WHO, uh, Dr. Somya Swaminathan, was one of the keynote speakers for a panel I organized um, uh, in, 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 in the context of COVID-19. Uh, and, and there were a group of other panelists, including uh, Dr. Ruth Stewart uh, from Africa Evidence Network, uh, Dr. Ramona Ludov uh, from WHO, and uh, uh, Dr. Dominic Prasad from University of Wisconsin. What has become very clear in those conversations and what I have been following is that um, we need to be uh, particularly um, uh, sensitive to the current conditions. Uh, I think uh, if you look at visionary uh, movements such as IA 2030 and an absolutely necessary vision for a healthy world, uh, what we are encountering today uh, is, is a matter of some, uh, some concern to most of us. Uh, I think what COVID-19 has done uh, has two things. Uh, one, it has definitely uh, put evidence-based and scientific agenda in the forefront uh, um, and, and how science can be practical and be helpful and how evidence is absolutely an essential component, whether it is what whatever we call it, monitoring, learning, and evaluation, is an essential component for program development and program implementation. But it also, um, uh, what COVID-19 has done is, it has coalesced and brought together movements who, got, who are against such healthy, um, uh, healthy uh, movements, uh, you know, where uh, most of us, or most of you who are, in, who are working so hard, uh, are also being confronted with a global, globally coalescing anti-vaccine movement. And I'm worried about it. Uh, and, and what it clearly shows is that, uh, that we have to be much more active, much more agile, much more aggressive uh, in the way we confront these challenges. And I do think what we have been trying to develop 
is to a program on responsive feedback that I hope uh, will will work with you, assist you in in uh, in in achieving your goals, achieving this vision. Even though it says immunization agenda 2030, the, the idea here is that what we do today, every day, uh, through continuous improvement, is what will allow us to reach that moment, that goal we have. And what responsive feedback, um, and, and Rana, please stop me at any time if you want, and I, I want to be sensitive. I was just to, about to ask you, so what is responsive feedback? Tell us right. tell us how this can help. Uh, you, have, you are in a room full of very motivated, very engaged yes. immunization staff who've made a commitment to help contribute to achieving the goals of immunization agenda 2030, which is to save 50 million lives by the end of this decade through action each at their levels, whether it's a health facility, a district, a region, or in the national team. Uh, so tell us what it is and how uh, you believe it, this uh, responsive feedback can help them in their journeys. Right. So um, in, in many ways, as I, I began the conversation, I, I think there is, there is there are there are some developments, contemporary developments, which are challenging uh, the the amazing commitment that you are all able to demonstrate. One of them is, as I said, the anti-vaccine movement. The second is a very complex information ecosystem. So what these calls for, both of them can provide continuous challenges to you as you are about to as you're embarking on this work. What responsive feedback offers is a particular kind of methodology of implementation program. Uh, it's a program that will, it's a methodology or a framework, let me put it that way, that will allow you, number one, to take into account all the stakeholders who are engaged in this movement and who are engaged in implementation along with you Question your own assumptions and allow you to correct your collect data and allow you to make course correction in the programming or implementation you are doing. So in that process, it allows you to continuously improve the program implementation in response to the current conditions and changing conditions. That means responsive feedback, feedback will allow you to be dynamic, agile, and improve your program continuously as you are implementing it. We go into the details on the modules that Reda will talk about and introduce you. But the goal here is the if you follow the steps that in the modules, it will allow you to be more dynamic uh, than can, which is what is called for as you are doing your very important and critical work. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Vish, Vish, Vishwanath from uh, Harvard, who, together through the Curve Consortium, has partnered with the Geneva Learning Foundation uh, in order to bring to you members of the IA2030 movement and hopefully many others uh, this quick introduction to responsive feedback. So to access the learning module, everyone who confirmed their commitment to the uh, Impact Accelerator received an invitation uh, last week. If you did not, please get in touch with us uh, so we can work out the details. But you should be able to get to what you see here. The quick introduction to responsive feedback. We invite you to follow a daily regimen to get through the module to learn about the basics and most critically as you work on your IA 2030 action plan to actually make progress um, and to use responsive feedback to harness the power of this approach designed to really help navigate uncertainty, navigate the complex challenges that you're facing. That's what this is about. Thank you so much uh, Professor and to you and your team for this uh, wonderful partnership and uh, one more opportunity for members of the movement for IA 2030 um, I'd like to ask if um, we, yeah, uh, if there is someone in the room who'd like to share, who's been through the module. I know there's some completers. Uh, please raise your hand. We'll just give it a try. I hadn't thought of this, but it'd be nice to hear uh, what taking this module is actually like, and what how it can actually help. Uh, uh, help you as we work on your IA 2030 action plan. We'll come back to that perhaps because we have a second guest 
And that is, and she is a returning uh, guest. This is Rose Weeks from uh, Johns Hopkins University, and she is working on um, the IA 2030 indicators. Last uh, Monday, she gave us uh, quite an extensive uh, presentation, and we had a wonderful consultative engagement where she asked uh, members of movement questions. We have uh, Rose, uh, welcome back. Uh, this time, uh, we have four questions for you, which uh, <laughs> we shared with you and which you can see on the screen would love to hear before we, you tell us about what you or as part of what you you took away from last week uh, tell us uh, uh, what you learned from last week how you'll use what you learned what are further opportunities for members to contribute to the IA 2030 M&E monitoring and evaluation indicators and um, then one final question which I think is the uh, potentially the million dollar question Rose uh, first of all a warm welcome to you Thank you so much, Shreda. It's wonderful to be back with this fabulous group. Um, I learned so much, um, and I, there, I, I did um, su summarize the feedback um, into three buckets. Um, and so generally, I learned this is a very active, committed group. Um, thank you so much for putting this, uh, this summary up. So these are the, uh, the feedback that the members shared last week last Monday on the IA2030 scorecard, which is a visualized representation of the framework for action that all uh, UN member countries have endorsed in 2020. Um, and uh, we are committed to, to representing the data from each of the countries in this scorecard, which is now published and available. And I'll put the link in the chat um, to that. So the feedback on the scorecard from the members was the members thought the design looked nice. They have familiarity with scorecards, having used scorecards uh, around commodity management for chai. Um, others use them at, at the country level. In Ghana, a member mentioned that they, they've used scorecards before to show a performance at the district level. Um, so that was really exciting to hear. Um, there's a lot of familiarity with the importance of using scorecards to, uh, for performance ma management and reporting and accountability. Um, some of the concerns from members that we heard on last week's assembly were um, that it wasn't clear how COVID and pandemic related data were included, such as vaccine introduction and coverage. Um, and so maybe making that a little bit more, more obvious because that is a lot of uh, the attention that's uh, being spent on immunization systems is on um, delivering COVID vaccines, addressing the concerns related to demand, uh, and also the impact of the uh, pandemic on routine immunization coverage, of course. Um, one of the other observations was that there wasn't subnational data except for one indicator that's represented uh, under the strategic priority banner, um, which pertains to lower performing districts, but it's an aggregation and it's not uh, really looking at sort of a nuanced list of the uh, performance measurements at the subnational level, which is a, for sure one of the um, valid critiques of, of the dashboard and we were very uh, very uh, keen to see if we can address that in some of the upcoming iterations. Um, I was really influenced by what the previous speaker uh, said related to the implementation um, framework that allows us to continually make course corrections in the implementation of the scorecard and that's really what we're seeking to do right. is to uh, continually improve so um, over the course of the decade on what we have here in the dashboard. Sounds wonderful, Rose. So how um, are you actually going to use what you learned? What does it change for the design, for the implementation of the scorecards? And um, for members of the IA2030 movement who want to contribute, either because they're monitoring and evaluation specialists or because they actually want to see the work that they're doing on the ground represented, shown, highlight, highlighted, uh, recognized in some way in the scorecard, uh, what, what might be some of the next steps we could imagine together? So two questions. How are you actually going to use what you gained from last week? And then kind of what's, what's next? What are the possibilities? Yeah, um, we are working to refine the country pages. And so we will be using the feedback from members to continually iterate and improve the design of the country pages, which uh, you all saw a mock-up of what that will look like. It's not currently live, but we want to make sure that this is coming through at the country level and it can be used, as you've said, to leverage support to address performance issues, justify resources to meet targets and to make sure that you can get the political buy-in and help with the workplace 
um, work plan determination. So to make sure we, we can meet the goals that the members of the assembly have set out for this work card, we need to publish the country pages um, in a really uh, rapid um, form. So we, we were hoping to make them publish uh, by September. The UN General Assembly, um, we're hoping that they're published by then. Um, and we really want to be responsive to the need to publish the country level data, which is coming very strong from this assembly. Okay. Um, in terms of opportunities uh, for the members to contribute, um, I think seeing how this is used in practice, this uh, this tool, especially when the country pages and the country data are part of it, we want to hear from you. We would love to report, uh, you know, to the larger mo uh, movement for I-2030, whether it's the Monitoring and evaluation, evaluation Work Group, we've talked about generating some stories that uh, really include a profile of members who are um, taking these uh, indicators and, do, and really um, making change happen at the local level or the, or the regional level, the national level. And so we want to hear more about how it's useful for you. And so if we could continue to have that feedback loop where we can um, report on what's working and, and then continue to hear what's not working, we can look at this as being a very much a dynamic tool over the course of the decade will continue to evolve to support this movement. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Rose Weeks from the IA2030 Indicators Will Stay Connected Consultative Engagement is only beginning in the decade-long process of Immunization Agenda 2030. Now, it's never happened that we've waited until the 24th minute of this assembly to hear from you, members of the IA2030 movement. So, Charlotte, I'm going to turn to you as uh, as we do uh, to answer these two questions. So, first question is, what is your IA2030 challenge and how have you moved forward with that challenge so far? And two, what difference really has your participation in the movement made, if any? Uh, Charlotte, who shall be the first speaker uh, that we hear from today? Thank you, Reda. I'll just be inviting those who are already in the room. Please raise your hand if you want to tell us, uh, you know, to answer the two questions uh, that are pasted. But before then, I would like to turn towards... Um, uh, okay, we have uh, Samuel uh, Maleuke Badiekan. Samuel, are you able to unmute yourself? Please go ahead and do so. And do introduce yourself and tell us when you joined the movement. Yeah, greetings. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Yeah, good afternoon, good morning, and good evening to fellow IA 2030 members. Yeah, so with my participation, I must say, uh, being a member of this movement has really helped me a lot. It has, uh, my challenge initially was, uh, there was a challenge with me getting support to, in terms of resources to uh, collect data on a research that my region is carrying out in Ghana. And uh, it's actually on uh, people adherence to the COVID-19 protocols and in, in addition to that, we're also looking at vaccine hesitancy, which is really making our region not able to get the expected coverage of COVID-19 vaccination. And it, uh, being a member of it has helped me to also find out other ways of engaging key stakeholders and other people that can help us to ensure that the research really goes through to help us achieve the expected target for COVID-19 vaccinations in the region. Samuel, and can you give us a, from this? Yeah, can you give us an example of of what you something you learned from your participation in the movement that you use to engage stakeholders differently or in a new way that you wouldn't have done or wouldn't have thought of without your participation in the movement? Yes, uh, what I learned was that from the movement. Uh, I was taught that it is very important that we look at our own local level uh, leadership within the local level that can also help us to uh, engage with uh, other organizations that can support us to carry out with the research. Uh, that was what I, I had. So locally, I got in, with that idea, I got in touch with, with our uh, regional director of health services and then also with our deputy director of public health. And with that, not only for this research, we have also tried to find other ways that we can mobilize funding to support research activities in the region. So with it, we, uh, locally, our regional director has supported us to start with the data collection. To as of now, we've gone through more than 50% of the targets 
respondents for the research. Uh, so hopefully, we are hoping that by the time that uh, by the end of June, we should be able to finish with the data collection, and then we will be sharing the results with members on on this platform. So that is how the uh, movement has really helped me to move ahead with the challenge that I was having. And then apart from this, we also learned that mostly it is very important that before we undertake a study in a system that is uh, is not receiving funding for research activities, we need to uh, learn how to write a proposal for funding. And with that, we should be able to carry on with our researches, that, uh, the research that we want to carry out in the region. So uh, this is how the movement has really helped me. Thank you, uh, Samuel. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Charlotte, I see there's already another microphone unmuted. Uh, who will we hear from next? Yes, Reda, it's uh, Ufoma Gloria Obasi. Gloria, uh, please go ahead, over to you, and do start by introducing yourself. Okay, um, good evening. I'm from Gloria, from the State, Nigeria. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Please go ahead. Okay, um, I'm a pharmacist and I'm, I'm not, I don't work in a so I saw the challenge and I, I joined the uh, Gloria, I don't know if it's just when me. The, when it was, um, my analysis was Hello? Can you yeah, Gloria you were breaking a little bit, but now I can hear you. Okay, my IA2030 challenge was on um, low coverage of of COVID-19 immunization within my community. The initial challenge I was working on was on the hesitancy of the community members to go take their vaccine. But then through the peers of the institution the analysis, I had the opportunity of meeting with the, with the immunization staff and I discovered that aside the instance challenge, that there were still other challenges. So for my action plan, instead of just targeting the hesitance, I, I am now working on the factors that are actually affecting the lower coverage of COVID-19, of which I found out that that stock out is one of the major problems and then information is only being decentralized and the movement has helped me because during one of the times uh, during the experience sharing time I actually came up with one of my personal challenges of not being able to get access to data within my local government so some other persons within it they told me that they directed me to who I get some data from and then I went back to the the facility and I was able, I was given the access to the data that I wanted. And so like last week when um, this impact acquisition program was also launched, we were made to ask to itemize the things we wish to achieve also, of which for my last week, I, one of the things I wanted to achieve was getting approval from the head of organization within the facility. So on presenting, but I had to print out my, my action plan to go show her. So on presenting her with the action plan, I said, because I said I wanted to get the permission, so I'm not a direct action staff under her way. So she told me that since we are all collaborating into, in terms of sharing the ideas of cognitive vaccination, that she gives her good support, that for all of the projects I intend going into, in terms of the decentralization, in terms of the um, messages I wanted, even the community pharmacy and all of that, that she gives her consent and, and it's something I will say I'm really, really happy about. And I still look forward to learning more from other members of the IA2030 because I know that other families that we go to they also, also offer their own ideas and share their experiences that could also help me into actualizing my action plan. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you, uh, Gloria. All right. We have a lot more we haven't even talked about <laughs> the Impact Accelerator yet. 
And we're not going to right away because we have some exciting announcements for all members of the movement. And that is called Teach to Reach Connect. So if you have participated in Teach to Reach Connect before, I would like you to type yes into the chat. And conversely, if you have not, then go ahead and type no. Um, so we know that you'll be. this will be your first time at Teach to Reach Connect. On the 4th of March, this is a quarterly event. So on the 4th of March, the last one, 8,584 immunization professionals. And the biggest single piece of news I can give you, we have many exciting announcements, but the biggest one is Teach Reach Connect 6 is for the very first time going to be open, not only to you as immunization professionals and primary healthcare professionals, but really to all health professionals who are have an interest, stand to gain from meeting, networking, and learning together. Just a quick reminder of what is Teach to Reach. It is really a unique opportunity to network. You press a button, you can go to the Teach to Reach page. You can hear from Tina here, who's an RI supervisor from Kaduna State, Nigeria, um, about her experience and her questions. And you can also see a demo of how um, networking actually works. Now, this sixth edition is going to be expanding to other areas of health. And I'm pleased to say that we'll be welcoming another community, uh, another health community focused on neglected needs of women's health on the 17th of June and specifically on female genital schistosomiasis. There are over 5,000 uh, people, health professionals in this community, and they'll be joining Teach to Reach for the very first time. So I... And meeting immunization colleagues and supporting each other as they're all working on projects, implementing action plans to make a difference uh, for this uh, FGS that affects an estimated 56 million women and girls. Next is new partners, new partnerships. First of all, I'm pleased to announce we've been collaborating with a zero dose community of practice with the uh, working group three of Immunization Agenda uh, 2030. And that will be a focus on the 17th of June on gender and immunization with respect to zero dose. The last announcement is one that I we cannot tell you <laughs> who the new partner is yet, but we will very soon. Um, let me just say this. The color should be a clue to, uh, to members who know uh, the different global partners. That's all I'll say for now. But the focus, that's the important part, will be on actually helping you, uh, finding, giving you new tools, learning from you as well on what actually works to promote confidence in vaccines and specifically COVID-19 vaccines. So that also will be on the 17th of June at, um, at Teach to Reach 6 uh, together with us will be the Women Who Deliver Vaccines Collective. So as Charlotte said in her, uh, in her presentation, 100, initially 138 women, uh, 143 women from 38 countries, sorry. And so uh, that will be another event together with the Zero Dose Community of Practice, uh, working together uh, focused on gender barriers for immunization. Uh, now, if you've already participated in Teach to Reach, I'd like to ask, what did you learn from this networking? And if you did not, uh, then what kinds of things would you like to discuss with your colleagues? So I see Charlotte has already lowered all the hands. Uh, I'd like to ask you again if, you, uh, if you'd like to share your experience there. Um, let's maybe be interesting to hear from Samuel you, uh, again, uh, who may not be, uh, who may be a first time Teach to Reach participant as well as Hassan Benya. And of course, we call for specifically for people who've never spoken before in an assembly. And second, we call specifically for women, uh, whether or not they have spoken before in an assembly as well. Uh, Charlotte, who shall we hear from first? Okay, so um, I see Hassan Benya is already saying hello, Reda. So, but he's All muted right. now. So, we'll turn towards Samuel. Samuel, we'll start with you and then we'll go towards Hassan uh, afterwards. Yes. Uh, greetings, everyone, once again. Yes. Uh, actually, participating with the, uh, in terms of the uh, Teach to Rich Connects, uh, previously, uh, when I was at some uh, other level, the district level, when the COVID 19 uh, initially started, uh, before our country responded, uh, with the Geneva Learning Foundation had already established us globally that we were able to network with other colleagues and also learn from other best practices that were ongoing in other jurisdictions. And with that, it actually helped me to be able to integrate uh, it into some other uh, capacity building activities that we were uh, 
providing for the sub district or facility level health staff so that they can provide uh, vaccination services, including growth monitoring and promotion and other services to communities without they being exposed to the COVID-19 virus. In terms of they providing services in one way directional and as well as also maintaining a distance of two meters apart. And it was really very helpful for me in that aspect. The uh, Teacher Connect actually helped me to be able to facilitate uh, my uh, my plan. It actually helped me to implement my plan during the time that I was expected to. It also pushed me and it also supported me for me to also connect with other members that are within the group that also provided their insights into whatever plans that I had and it was uh, fruitfully implemented. So mostly what I know is that with this, it's actually to help us to boost us to make sure that whatever plans we have in place, we should be able to implement it without hesitation. It also gives us a guide as to what to do, and also help us to also know what we are doing at whatever level that we are in, in terms of implementation of our plans. Thank you, Samuel. Thank you. Yeah, so we, will you be with us on the 17th of June for Teach to Reach 6 then? That's the, that's the final question. Yes, hopefully that's my plan. I plan right. to uh, take part in it. Uh, so so if so, unless maybe a uh, work takes me out of uh, where there is network, I'll certainly participate in the uh, coming seventeenth. I'll be there. All right, uh, wonderful. Thank you, uh, Samuel. Um, uh, I see. Uh, so we have our gender and country rule. Once one person from a country has spoken, the next person should be from another country, and once a man has spoken, it should be followed by a woman. Which is why I have I have called on Boma Otobo uh, to uh, to speak. Um, I know uh, Boma that you've already participated in Teach to Reach. So what did you learn from this networking? It's not. It's very different from webinars. It's even different from our assemblies. Uh, it's really that one-to-one -one connection with fellow immunization professionals. How has it helped you make a difference in your daily work, Boma? Yes, thank you, Reda, and uh, thank you, Charlotte, and the rest of the team. Actually, I'm so glad to be connected and um, part of this movement. Yes, so the Teach to Reach Connect, I've attended several, but the last one was very spectacular to me. I was able to meet um, some professionals, um, one from Pakistan, another from the Philippines, and the last one from Ghana. But one that I also got to meet was one from Nigeria, from Kano State, and that was Dr. Shehu. In fact, um, the moment when we, we logged in and asked who we were, ah, he said, oh, I know you, Mrs. Otobo, I've been hearing your name. I said, same to with me, Sir, you, I know you, you're the IM of um, Kano State and EOC and all of that, now moved to the primary health care board. So I was so happy that um, this connection was made available. First, I learned how challenges from other states, other countries are similar to what we are also facing in Nigeria and also how they were able to overcome them. I was able to borrow leaves from here and there. And when we put this together, because I'm also at the national level, strategically we were able to come up with some things that are happening in other countries, which if we also adapt to our country, we'll be able to also scale through. One major thing for, for, for all the connections I made was the issue of vaccine hesitancy. And that kept on ringing a bell in my ears. And we still have the challenge, but I hope one day we will overcome it where people will just on their own see the need to be vaccinated. So I just want to encourage everyone, when the next session comes up, please don't fail to take advantage of it. It's a very good way to meet other professionals and learn from their world of experience. Over. Thank you. Thank you, Boma Otobo. And I believe you are one of the founders of the Women Who Deliver Vaccines Collective. What is this collective about for you? Why is it important that women who work in vaccination at all levels, you yourself are deputy director at the national level, uh, but there are you are working in this collective side by side with women who work in facilities, in districts, in regions or states. Uh, why for you is this Women Who Deliver Vaccines uh, Collective important? Why did you become one of its co-founders? Yes, so Reda, thanks again. As I speak to you, I'm in one um, local government in Kano State, and I've been to two facilities today where I was able to interact with the women 
who bring their children for vaccination. Having women as the focal point, I'm not saying the men are not good, they are good. But you see, when a woman talks to a woman, she knows how, she understands the pain through which you know these children can be brought into this world and how important it is to keep these children healthy. You know, vaccination is a cost benefit um, thing that I want you to do. So speaking to this women gives me great joy. And that's why I feel the need to connect. I mean, women are so important. I'm not saying men are not, but it's a woman who takes the child. It's a woman who knows when the when the child is sick. It's a woman who feels the pain more than even the males who also help. But I know that women have a big role to play in this. And I would want us to encourage the women to still continue to play that big role and fill in the gaps on behalf of the families. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aboma. Let's, uh, I believe if we were sharing physical space, <coughs> this something like this would happen after hearing these uh, um, stories and views shared. This is all part of the what we call the full learning cycle, the Geneva Learning Foundation's contribution to the movement, a continuum of action from knowledge all the way to impact. 8,354 of you responded to the call to join the movement. And in the Impact Accelerator, what we call the Launchpad, four weeks of focusing on developing your action plans. 4,139 of you opted in, chose to be a part of this because you want to. And there's a very simple question we're asking with the Impact Accelerator. You developed an action plan for Immunization Agenda 2030. Whatever level you work at, whoever you are in the health system, you had that opportunity, you seized it. Now, are you ready to take action? And this is the second week, so we're going to hear what some of you have done with your action plans and how it is actually turning out. Perhaps some of you asked, uh, have used responsive feedback. We'll be going back at the end of this session to Vish, Viswanath, uh, responsive the co-creator of responsive feedback to hear his reflections after listening to several of the stories that have been shared today a reminder today is the day when you set your action to complete by friday so you define you decide what you're going to do you relate it of course to your specific goal the one you want to achieve within four weeks which is already a very short-term goal but then remember, whatever you put there, remember that on Friday, we'll be coming back to you and saying, so how did it turn out? First of all, did you do it? If not, tell us why. What, what are you going to do differently the following week? If you did it, then what is your next step? How is it actually helping you make progress to towards your goal? And you know that every week we also ask you what we call the community barometer, you, the, what, uh, using a value creation uh, stories framework in which we ask you, has participation affected your social connections? Is it changing you as a professional? Is it changing your ability to influence the world? And these indicators have kept going up since the 7th of March. This week, I'm almost pleased to report that the participation made me see my world differently uh, went down by 0.02. This is on the scale of one to six. It's not statistically significant, but uh, it is a change. It's been going up and, and really we, what we hear in the assembly echoes what we're finding through this, uh, through this framework. But if you can, if you have time, it's just five questions and tell us then how uh, participation is actually changing you. That is uh, what we're focusing on in the final weeks of this first full learning cycle for Immunization Agenda 2030. Now, we want, would like you to, uh, uh, if you need help with implementation, if, you, if it's going really well, conversely, and you want to share your discoveries, what you're learning, what you're finding, uh, Charlotte is going to uh, share, if she hasn't already, the link to join the sharing of experience that takes place twice a week on Tuesdays and Thursdays with Dr. Francois Gass and Charlotte Mbou. Really unique opportunity uh, to share with your colleagues, to hear what is shared and also to learn uh, together. Now, because this is week two, many of you have already implemented actions in the first week and many others are still working on their action plans. That is fine. Wherever you are, whatever pace you need to go at, um, it, the point is to keep moving. So we have 53 scholars who really shared their progress. And so we have questions for those 53. You can see the four questions up on screen. Remind us what is your goal for June 17th. Don't forget to introduce yourself and tell us when you join the movement. But really what we want to know is, have you completed your week one action? What what happened? How did it turn out? What surprised you? 
Uh, do you have a lesson learned, the success or challenge? What is your next action? What are you going to do? Because today is the day you set the next action. What are you actually going to try to finish by this Friday? Charlotte, who shall be the first person that we hear from? We know the list of people who actually shared stories, but we know many others who did not share, but still made progress. Who, who have you selected? Uh, rather, I'm inviting Halasan Abdurrahman. Halasan, I don't know if you're able to unmute yourself to share with us. If not, I'm going to turn towards uh, Eunice, uh, Eunice Taya Zagli. And the questions are also in the chat. Red has put them in. So Hello. Yes. Hello. Hi, yes. Hi good afternoon. Hello, good afternoon. Afternoon, please do start by introducing yourself. Uh -huh. I'm Eunice Tia Jagle, a health promotion officer working on uh, immunization in Ghana, in charge of immunization, social mobilization, advocacy, and uh, behavior change communication at the Greater Accra Regional Office, Ghana Health Service. Uh, I wasn't part of the Teach to Reach. But with last week, uh, target set, I said I was going to engage the uh, school managers as well as health uh, directorate managers of the district health uh, team, as well as some parents on second year of life uh, vaccination. As part of that program, I got another insight of how we have neglected the mentally challenge in immunization. When I brought these stakeholders together, in our discussion, it came out that we have neglected the physically challenged who are held at the uh, prayer camps, uh, herbal treatment centers who have children and uh, need vaccination but do not have the opportunity to go out, or the children that have been delivered and uh, parents are uh, seeing them as physically, uh, mentally challenged for which they don't want to go out of the, uh, their homes to the various uh, vaccination centers. We have left them out and I think it is an eye opener for me and going forward, I feel as part of this program, in, if I participate in the Teach to Reach, I'll be able to get more ideas that maybe previously I was not um, exposed to. So this is my submission for uh, the progress in what I've done last week based on the uh, target set for last week for uh, achievement. It was as a result of that I couldn't join the Friday session because at the time of the Friday session, we have not finished our discussion at the stakeholders meeting I was organizing. Thank you. Over. Thank you, Eunice. We're going to hear one more person, Charlotte, and then we'll go to uh, uh, to François Gass, uh, our guide on the side for the experience sharing sessions, and we'll go back to Vish, uh, Vish Vanath, uh, who's been uh, listening as our guest, let's say guide on the side, um, to get their, their final questions and reflections in response to the progress being reported by members of the movement who are working on their IA 2030 action plans against their local challenge, something that matters to them where they want to make a difference. Uh, Charlotte, who shall we hear from uh, next? Hello. I see Alassane Al Abdurrahman is already unmuted, Reda. So I think uh, we'll Wonderful. listen to Alassane. Alassan, yes. Good afternoon, everyone. Good evening. And uh, this is uh, Abdurrahman Alassane. Um, speaking from Ghana, uh, my challenge at the beginning was the low uptake of uh, Mrs. Rubella's second dose, and we tried to uh, review our data. And for our first uh, quarter review, we realized that some of the subjects were having challenge which we identified and then we tried to list with the sub has to actually see what is really happening. And by so doing, 
were able to um, study their CWC uh, registers to identify children who are not uh, or who are defaulting or from taking the second dose of measles. And we were able to sort out those children and then try to liaise with the health workers who are operating within that geographical area and then um, liaise with the community members where these children are actually um, living. And in our course of first uh, interaction with the community members, we realized that some of the defaulters are uh, Family members actually uh, re, uh, moved to a uh, different uh, settlement just to uh, continue their farming activities due to uh, the, 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 the land where they are farming being exhausted. And so we are able to identify the areas that they have settled for their farming activities. And then this week will be targeting them for our immunization. So our my week one challenge was to um, try to identify these children and where they are coming from. And we are able to do that. So my action uh, was taken in the right direction. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank, thank you very much indeed. So we're going to go to Francois Gass for follow-up, for sort of follow-up comments and questions. We're not uh, going to ask you to answer them, but just to know what the, if we were in an experience sharing session, what would be the next uh, question? Uh, and then uh, we'll close with uh, final comments and reflections from Vish Viswanath, who's uh, attending the assembly for the first time as a, as a friend of the movement for IA 2030 and also the lead subject matter expert on responsive feedback. Um, Francois? Uh, hi to everyone. Hello, Reda, and hello to all those who are here today. I think what I've noticed, uh, and I think really key to do better, is kind of a further situation analysis in the action plan. Try to find, to dig, to find the root cause of the problem and to address it. And both uh, Eunice and, and uh, Alassane both went in their own area to dig to find really the cause of the challenge they have in a different way. But I think what I find as a commonality was uh, a, an interaction of the community they target, not assuming what was the problem, but more trying to get to listen to them and to understand really what was the true problem. And, I th and then they develop their action based on what they found. And I think it's remarkable and congratulations for your step-by-step -step approach, which is leading to at Alastan for uh, identified the high-risk group for not being immunized with a routine second dose, tra tracking them, tracking their movement, and now organizing a corrective action next week to get them immunized. And I think this is a fantastic process. Is we have to, a lot to learn from those two uh, scholars. And uh, I feel that uh, it's almost an example of uh, what is is needed to get the result that they try to achieve. So thank you to both of you. And it highlights the importance of collecting data, root cause of problem, to either to, to tailor the corrective action based on the information and have results. Thank you. Thank you, Francois. Um, Francois has been with us three times a week since March the 7th and more. Uh, Vish, Vish Vanatha is here with us uh, for the first time participating in an assembly of the movement for IA 2030. Uh, Vish would love to hear your reflections. What did you hear in the uh, you know, somewhat chaotic uh, assembly with many voices, uh, with connectivity issues? W what is your takeaway from a session like this one? Thank you, Reda. I, I think I just have only three points to make as a result of this. Uh, number one, uh, I, I think, uh, first, before I say that, uh, let me just say, it, listening to this session, being a part of it has been extremely inspiring to me. Uh, I, I just want to congratulate you at JLF and, and everybody else who's participating in the moment 
uh, and, and express my gratitude for the work you are doing. Having said that, I heard three things. One, the challenge of inclusiveness. I'm so inspired when people started saying we should have more gender participation, how more women should be participating, why they have a, a particular way of reaching out uh, to other women. Uh, or somebody who else who said something about identifying local leaders and local groups. Or a third person who said, how do we, why, why are we ignoring those who are physically challenged? All of them, the common theme here is inclusiveness. That is, you know, how do we become much more inclusive in this moment where we are really in, including people who are not a part of the mainstream, who are often ignored for a variety of cultural, structural power reasons. And how do we make them a part of the movement? And I think that's where I, I believe, you know, uh, uh, it's important to have new methods, new approaches to this. Second, I also heard about the importance of listening and how you know, Al Hassan's example is a wonderful example illustration of how paying close attention to what the problem is and how trying to overcome that problem by listening. The third point about, uh, you know, identifying the causes of why something is not working. It goes back to what we said in the responsive feedback. Looking at your own assumptions, questioning your own assumptions of why something is not working and revisiting those assumptions based on your listening and making it, you know, making those course corrections. I think those three points, you know, make it very clear, you know, how we can help you in being a part of the moment uh, and how we can work with you uh, for in, in assisting you in this extraordinarily important and inspiring work you are all doing. So I'm grateful to you for letting me a part of, at least a small part of your moment today. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Vish. And of course, you'll find Vish has invited members of the movement to learn about responsive feedback in a module uh, developed in partnership between the Geneva Learning Foundation and the Curve Consortium. Now, we are doing this for the Anglophones for the very first time. This is an opportunity to meet scholars from your country. So. What we're going to do is we're going to connect on Telegram. You can stay connected to the Zoom room. You'll, you'll hear, we'll be sort of commentating uh, how it's going for the different country groups. Um, go to your countries. Uh, let me actually correct these instructions. Um, you, to your country um, channel. Uh, introduce yourself, present your implementation progress. So um, first of all, you have to let us know you're here. So let us know you are in the channel. So send a message, say hello, and then that's when we can actually uh, open up the um, uh, the live chats. Uh, you can the live audio uh, call, so you can connect with each other. I'll be working with uh, Ja and Charlotte. We'll be going through the room, so please be patient. If not everybody from your country joins right away, but some of the groups have several hundred members. So there's an opportunity to have a really, really great conversation with just the people from your country. While it's wonderful, this assembly is a time when all the countries come together. There's also a need for, and we've been pretty vocal about wanting to meet with folks from your country. That's what we're doing today. All right, Charlotte, do you have anything more to add in terms of what can help people understand and clarify what how this works? Well, uh, maybe another easy way, Reda, is uh, for those who are in the Zoom room right now, if you want us to open your country room directly, you can type the name of your country right here in the chat. I have already opened the room for Nigeria. So those who are from Nigeria, if you click on the link for the country team uh, and uh, you click on the link for Nigeria, you should be able to join uh, 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 the video chat in your country group. So I see Ghana has already in also indicated right here in the chat. And Reda, Charlotte, Sierra Leone as well. Yeah, you know what I just saw is that we ended the Francophone um, assembly more than an hour ago, or I think more than even more than that, two hours ago. Yeah, and there's still people ago. talking in the in from Senegal, from the uh, uh, Fran uh, from uh, Cameroon and a couple other countries just amazing so let's uh yeah uh just follow charlotte's instructions and uh we'll be there to uh help you kick off the discussion with people from your country from the movements so you can begin to uh or continue to get to know each other all right
Nigeria is already open. There is uh, Abu Bakar Suleiman and Dayo Iwan to Nigeria. I'll be leaving the Nigerian room right now to open for Ghana. Hi, Dayo. Great to have you. I leave everything to your able hands. All right, I've just opened the Ghana room, so we need at least one Ghanaian to join. And then we'll hand the room over to you. Yep, so Radiant. Um, the chat, the, the audio uh, video chat is open. Please join. All right, so we need at least one person to join. If you're in the room and you see the little blue strip, uh, that shows that the live stream in your room has started, such as in Ghana, you need to join. Okay, Radiant, thank you. All right, Ghana room is now open. We'll go to Liberia next. Charlotte, how, how is it going from your side? So... Okay, and we need at least two members to join uh, before we can hand over the room. If not, we will close. So if we don't get at least two people, because you need two people to have a conversation, we'll then close the room. We'll close the room. All right, so that's Liberia. Uh, doesn't look like there's anybody responding here. So let me go to Somalia. How do I join? I tried in the Ghana room. But it looks like the Ghana room died. There was one person, Radiant, but they left the room. So let me try starting it again. So the Ghana room is live again, but we need at least two people to join before we can hand over the room. Okay, great. Yeah. All right, I'm now trying to open up the room for Somalia. I don't see anybody joining from Somalia, so please join if you're in the Somalia chat channel. Uh, please join so that we can hand the room over to you. I see Dr. Mohammed Abdirahman Omar, Abdikani, Dr. Abu Kadir Kenyan. Uh, let me go to Pakistan. Let's see if uh, Pakistan is here. So, Pakistan... Um, if you are oh. from Pakistan, so I just opened the room for Ethiopia. Okay. So I'm waiting. All right. And so the, just to clarify, the first thing when you get to your channel, you need to put a message. You can say hello, everyone, or I am ready. You put anything you want but um all right and for those who still are not connected to their uh, country channel in telegram um so for rafael who says how do we join the ghana room well i just shared the link you can find the link to the ghana room in that document it's a word document or maybe someone else from ghana who is already in there can uh, can, can join it so pakistan no one is is joining so we have active conversations for Nigerians, um, for Nigeria, Ghana, Senegal, <laughs> Cameroon is still going. That's great. Uh, right, let me see if we can start the India room because Pakistan was not successful. So let me just see. Okay, uh, Padam Jain. Hello, Padam um, from India. Padam, you've joined the. Uh, you should be able to unmute. Yeah. All right. Good evening to you. Of course, uh, my goal is to connect you with uh, fellow members of the India country team. So, I would ask if you want to stay, um, and we'll see if there are other members of the team who join, and then you can have a conversation with them. All right, uh, I see Nigeria. 
going on. It'd be, it would be disappointing if um, the uh, Indian scholars did not did not join. But I don't see anyone else, Padam, uh, joining. Do not be disheartened. Of course, people are busy. I, I realize it is late at night in uh, South Asia. Uh, so, all right, there is Bala. All right, I will take leave of you, Padam and Bala. I, uh, I wish you, I hope you have a good, very interesting a constructive conversation. Take care. All right. So the the uh, India team is off to its own conversation. And right, I see Uganda. I see Annette Kisakai. If not, we'll close the room. Yep. So let's give Uganda a chance. And I believe where is Kenya, Charlotte? Do we have Kenya? Okay, I've not opened Kenya, but there's someone indicating uh, that they want to join Kenya, so I'll leave uh, Tanzania and I've go just, to Kenya. I've just opened up Kenya. Let me just see if anybody's. Okay. So now we need there's, Kenyans uh, to Joyce, join. Joyce Washira. Joyce Washira that is here in the. Um, Joyce, if you can go over to Kenya on Telegram, Joyce is here in Zoom. Yep. And sharing the link again. Now, this uh, document has was shared last week, has been shared many times. All right, I see Samson Thuo from Kenya has joined. Samson, welcome. Congratulations on being the first one from your country team. And <laughs> we have Joseph Ngugi, a longtime leader and scholar in our community. Joseph, it is... Uh, you are remarkably constant uh, and diligent, so always a pleasure to see you here. All right, now that there's two of you, I can leave and wish you a productive, constructive meeting. Take care. Okay, Charlotte, I think it. this is looking good. Let me try Uganda again. Okay, while I try uh, Liberia, because there is a Kelvin uh, Boima. Of course, Nigeria has the greatest number of participants. <laughs> yes. Um, Which is wonderful to see. Uh, okay, looks like Uganda. Let me see. No, Uganda. There's still nobody. Um, Opening for Ethiopia again. Now. All right. I'm still waiting for Uganda to respond. Okay, Annette Kisake is in. All right, so. Oh, and Charlotte, one of the things we can do, it's kind of tricky, but um, let me see. Where is it? Yeah, I think we can actually invite. I know there's a button to invite others. Do you know, have you? Okay, yeah, no, that's exactly. <laughs> yes. uh, yeah, that's what I'm doing. If you go to, um, like, if you open a room and uh, uh, Telegram gives you the possibility to see those who are online. And that's right. so, like, in Ethiopia, uh, Mohammed, Malin, and Melese, they were online. So I s I've sent them invites to join. Mohammed, Malin has joined, but Melese has not yet joined. So I'm waiting for him to join so that I can connect the two and leave the room. Okay, great. So, Melese, if you're hearing, Please, can you just uh, join the video chat? Oh, yeah. Right, I see some of it. Last seen a long time ago, so maybe that explains it. I think uh, when we introduced the country groups, it wasn't entirely clear why people should be joining them or what they would be doing with them because we saved that for the accelerator, but that may have uh, confused some people. So uh, now is the time when we really use it. Um, so if you haven't, let me see. All right. So I see on the uh, Uganda group, I now have a couple of people. It's not a huge group. Let me see. Annette, I suggest you um, uh, you can stay on, and hopefully some of your colleagues that have been invited will uh, uh, will be uh, joining soon. And you should be able to unmute yourself and speak to welcome them when they do when they do join. me just oh actually i was i was muted on the telegram channel so annette uh thank you for being the first one from uganda to join of course 
if it doesn't work out and you have other things you need to do, then please <laughs> you know, do, do not feel compelled to stay. But there may be other colleagues who are still sort of figuring out how this works. Um, so if you can stay on, that I'll give uh, other Ugandans a chance to, uh, to meet you. There are many. Uh, so Cameroon, Uganda. Uh, sorry, Cameroon, Ghana, uh, Zimbabwe. All right. Oh, I see. Zimbabwe is trying to get a start. So I'm going to go there. All right. Um, so that's for Sifiwe Murepa. If you're still there, Sifiwe, uh, please join. You're welcome to join the, uh, uh, the room. Just click on the join button. And then, of course, uh, I see Su Esfundo. Um, let's see. Doning Don Imaginable Abebe Sorsai, Eila Luca, Martin Ezeama, Linda Asentewa. Diana Awino. Okay, I see some of you are trying to join uh, the live stream um, on the movement channel, but you need to go to your country group. So let me just... Um, Okay, Sifiwe Murepa. All right, Sifiwe. Uh, good to see you uh, managed to connect to the um, to the live chat. Uh, it looks like you're the only one uh, who's here right now. I would suggest staying a couple of minutes if you can afford it. Again, this you know, we, we'll announce this properly for next week. It usually takes two weeks for people to understand like what this is about, and then by week three, that's when we really have people joining. It's a process, so it's okay. But Sifiwe, thank you for uh, the fact that you managed to make it uh, this time. For Jaraha Abdul Hamid, who is um, asking for the link for Nigeria. Um, for Tracy, who's asking for the link to Kenya. Please uh, <laughs> read the messages. The best place to go is if you're already in Telegram. Is um, Let me just get Same for Rosalind, who's looking for the link for Liberia. Thank you, Ibrahim. Yes, that's what we want to see, is solidarity between members supporting each other. Ibrahim has shared the link to the Nigeria room, which I think is the biggest one. Um, and again, how you join the live stream, you click on join. You should see join the video chat, and that's how you do it. It really is that simple. All right, let me see. Somalia is trying again, so let me just see if we can get Somalia started. And we still have 148 people in the room, which is just amazing. So... All right, I think the countries that are likely to have a conversation going are now going. Just to recap for those of you who were not here in the beginning, some of the main announcements. Teach to Reach Connect, unique opportunity to network and learn. In the March edition, this is a quarterly event. There were 8,584 people registered for Teach to Reach 5. That's 4,213 Anglophones. So, for Junior Katesh, who's asking for the link for Tanzania, check uh, the link. Uh, and for the Teach to Reach link, yes. Uh, if you haven't yet requested your invitation for Teach to Reach 6, you should do, do so now. Uh, this, the big, biggest change in this Teach to Reach is that for the very first time, we're having. We're opening up beyond immunization and you'll be able to invite not only your maternal and child health colleagues, but also other 
your health colleagues who are interested in networking um, will have a focus this time on neglected tropical diseases and on one disease in particular, female genital schistosomiasis, FGS, that affects an estimated 56 million women and girls in sub-Saharan Africa. So we'll have a session with a community of over 5,000 change makers who are trying to make a difference, working to make a difference at their level, whether it's at the facility, district, region, or national uh, levels for FGS. We're announcing a, uh, we're pleased to announce that uh, we'll have uh, the third of a series of sessions focused on zero dose and gender. So if you're, whether your interest is in zero dose or in gender, this session will combine these two. And this is done in collaboration with IA 2030 Working Group 3 and the Zero Dose Community of Practice. And then we have one big announcement, which unfortunately we cannot make today because we're still working out the details. Um, and this is a new partnership through which hopefully will help you in very concrete ways promote confidence in vaccines. So address a lot of the hesitancy, um, the community engagement, all those that nexus of issues in very practical ways to help you. That will also be at Teach to Reach uh, One Health on the 17th of June. And then again, um, you'll be hearing from, listening to, and engaging with the collective of women who deliver vaccines. So that's the Teach to Reach announcement. If you haven't, now the next announcement, uh, that was, this was all said in the beginning of the session. I know some of you joined late, so if you're still here, you may find this useful as a catch-up. So here, responsive feedback is... Uh, new approach and today we had the pleasure of receiving Professor K. Vish Viswanatha from the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and that is uh, he is the co-creator of Responsive Feedback so uh, you can take the quick introduction to Responsive Feedback and learn from him and his colleagues Dr. Rachel McLeod and Emeka Emmanuel Okafor. Um, everyone if you confirmed your participation in the Impact Accelerator you receive the invitation to join the responsive feedback module. And then we also heard back from um, Rose Weeks of the IA 2030 indicators. She gave her feedback, what she learned from the 23rd of May assembly and gave us a sense of what the next steps might be in that respect. So that's it for this accelerator. We'll have a final round of applause as there's still 138 people in the room. Just amazing. Wishing you well. Remember, Again, the way the accelerator works is very simple. If you don't yet have an action plan, make sure you complete it. But really, once you have your action plan, this is about setting, what are you going to do by Friday? It's, there's two questions. It's a questionnaire with two questions. That's all you need to do. But don't remember on Friday, don't forget. I mean, on Friday, we'll ask you to tell us how it turned out. That is the key. And it's okay if you did not finish your action. There's no penalty. There's no wrong. There's nothing wrong about not having completed the action. What would be wrong would be not reflecting on why that you didn't, you weren't successful, or why you were successful in order to improve the following week. That's what the impact accelerator is about. And if you haven't yet registered for the experience sharing sessions on Tuesday and Thursday, uh, you have the link. We'll be sharing the slide deck in a few minutes. Take care. I think that's it for the second assembly of the Impact Accelerator for Immunization Agenda 2030.